I'm Paulo Vilela. My colleague uh, Hilda Lu and I uh, will be talking today about our experience using the functional paradigm to architect um, high performance enterprise applications. So we will not be talking about uh, you know, ACA streams or uh, some of the other really cool stuff that uh, some of the other presentations have uh, covered. But we will talk about topics which I think will be of interest to many uh, enterprises. So if you work for uh, companies that typically use uh, Java Enterprise Edition or Spring to develop their systems, then you come to the right talk. Uh, we were fortunate to be working uh, on a U.S. Uh, federal program with uh, forward-thinking stakeholders who understood the potential benefits of what we were proposing and who supported us when we recommended building their next generation of uh, mission-critical backend uh, services using Scala and the functional architecture approach. Uh, we'll start uh, by talking about the characteristics of uh, our application. Uh, we'll outline the architecture approach we used. We'll talk uh, briefly about the challenges we encountered, and then we'll spend the majority of the uh, talk going over the uh, approaches we used to address uh, several of those challenges. So our application is a, is a backend that provides RESTful services to be called by a number of other front-end applications. And our services are stateless. They expose a basic a core uh, insurance application functions of uh, creation, um, determination, and submission. The um, business uh, functions that we deal with involve extremely mind-bogglingly complex uh, business rules, and uh, some of them uh, involve calls to external systems. Uh, the front-end applications that uh, call us, they mediate between our back-end services and uh, end users, uh, exposing finer grain services to SPAs running on browsers. Um, our uh, projected peak volume is of 300,000 uh, requests per minute. The application needs to be highly available, but we do enjoy the uh, ability to take the application offline for four hours during outside of business hours when needed. And um, from a data perspective, our data objects are very large, and our mix of reads and writes is about evenly divided between reads and writes. <clears throat> So the uh, expectations around the technical qualities of our application are in line with what uh, folks expect nowadays with applications built with reactive characteristics. So we need to be scalable, high performance, make efficient use of infrastructure, provide predictable response times, uh, be resilient to failures, provide useful uh, responses in case of errors, and uh, be nice and mindful of the systems that we call so we don't uh, overload and over overwhelm them. Um, and we want all these uh, nice technical characteristics, but not at the expense of making the system uh, difficult to develop uh, and maintain and support. So we also want high development productivity. We want testability. We want to be uh, able to respond quickly to business changes. Uh, we need to be able to easily support uh, and operate and troubleshoot uh, this system in production. And uh, very importantly, we also needed to be able to leverage a large pool of uh, Java uh, skilled developers and to use an existing uh, set of uh, assets and uh, Java capabilities available in the organization. So these were some of the constraints we, we faced. So I already mentioned uh, Scala earlier, so it's no surprise that our application is built 
uh, with Scala on the Lightband stack. We used Play as our uh, HTTP listener, web listener, although we may replace it with Akka Streams down the road. I'm sorry, Akka HTTP. Uh, we also use uh, Akka Actors, but in a very focused way. We don't use it uh, pervasively. Um, as I've alluded to earlier, we're not just doing uh, functional programming. We're using the functional paradigm from the top down, the way we architect the software, the way we structure the software, all the way down to the code. So our unit of modularity is a function. And we have something that we call a flow, which is uh, simply a function that composes other functions, uh, which are finite range. Uh, each of our REST services exposed by our application is implemented by Flow, which is a function. Uh, our functional architecture is very zealous about cleanly separating uh, business functions from architectural plumbing, meaning that most uh, of the business functions that we have do not have any dependence whatsoever on architecture functions or libraries. Uh, on the other hand, though, the flows, which are high level than the the base level functions. They may compose business functions with architecture functions and deal with concerns like you know, timeouts and uh, uh, bulk heading and circuit breakers and composing futures and that kind of stuff. Um, it goes without saying that you need a good DevOps architecture in order to automate your development and deployment, and we, we have one. We made uh, choices that uh, made sense to us in terms of the uh, technologies that, that we picked uh, based on the team's experience and the, uh, existing, uh, the existing capabilities in our organization, uh, as well as the, the stack that we, that we chose, Lightband stack. So it should be no surprise that uh, coming into an organization that was accustomed to Java and uh, introducing the functional paradigm, Scala, and the Lightband stack uh, was a little bit of a shock. Uh, defining the functional architecture, um, function-oriented software architecture was a really key uh, challenge for us, uh, especially making it uh, work in practice. So the ideas make sense, but getting it to work in practice, you know, the devil's in the details. The new technology stack was more complex at least in the eyes of uh, people who uh, had no prior experience with it. And uh, even though it's uh, a lot more powerful than the, the traditional Java stack, uh, it also offers a number of new and creative ways for people to mess things up. Um, and in particular, coding, debugging, uh, unit testing, and performance monitoring especially are a lot more challenging with a non-blocking uh, execution model. So uh, these were um, key challenges for us. And last but not least, assembling a team that would be qualified to deliver with the new stack was a big concern for us. So how do we address these uh, challenges? Well, first, uh, by sticking to the functional paradigm. Um, our function-oriented uh, architecture was really central to our delivery approach. Uh, for people accustomed to the object-oriented paradigm, our, our function-oriented approach uh, is a very different way to structure the code, uh, to structure the modules. But for people accustomed to functional programming, our approach is not really new. The uh, problem is uh, people on the team were not accustomed to functional programming. Um, and even if it's not new, uh, the, the way we did things was very prescriptive in terms of how we structure and decompose our system uh, in terms of functions. So I mentioned earlier the flows. So flows are compositions of functions that can be executed sequentially or in parallel. And um, we uh, enforce a strong separation of business logic from data access uh, functions that read from the database or access the database, as well as data access functions that ex uh, call external systems. So have very, very clear separation of uh, uh, concerns. And we also, uh, th that's also important from the perspective of separating pure functions from functions with side effects, which would be functions that access the database or external systems. 
Uh, we also uh, enforce a strong separation of uh, business logic from the architecture. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the flows are responsible for um, composing architecture uh, features into the basic functions that uh, are responsible for business logic, uh, data access, etc. cetera. Um, what else? Yeah, another thing that's worth uh, mentioning is that uh, we proactively managed our dependencies to keep uh, the functions as uh, self-contained as possible. This, this is an important idea, whether you're doing functional uh, or object-oriented. Uh, it's a good way to minimize accidental complexity. And um, uh, we'll see uh, later that the functional paradigm kind of already helps uh, to minimize cross-dependencies between modules but you still need to be very uh, watchful and, and pay attention to it, be proactive about it. One of the things we did uh, that was uh, important in that regard was uh, our dependency injection and configuration mechanisms uh, were designed uh, specifically with uh, that in mind, minimization of dependencies across modules. Uh, one last uh, uh, point here is, I mean, a lot of this, this stuff that we did uh, in Scala, uh, especially considering our developers uh, with a Java background. Um, things could be written in Java as well, but it's much more natural to do uh, functional with, uh, with Scala than, than in Java, so obviously that's what we did. This is an example of uh, flow composing a bunch of functions with some functions executing sequentially, some in parallel, and some conditionally. And uh, this is very easy to implement using a for comprehension. And this is an example of the corresponding code. I, I don't want to spend any time uh, going over the code, but I just wanted to show that the uh, for comprehension maps very, very directly to the, to the boxes on that flow chart. And to emphasize a point made earlier about the flows being compositions of base level functions, uh, flows may also compose lower level flows. So typically we have um, you know, at most three levels of nesting of flows. Most, most of our flows are either you know, one level deep, so they just compose atomic functions, or they may have another level of flow under them. Uh, this is for uh, benefit of those who still uh, stick to the object-oriented way of doing things. I uh, wanted to kind of make the point here that, you know, compare the uh, dependencies between modules and depth of call stack between the object-oriented and functional paradigms. Uh, when you uh, compose uh, three functions, if you look at the left part of the picture, uh, you know, F1, F2, and F3 in a simple composition pipeline, the three functions are at the same level and they don't have any dependence on each other. The dependence is really lifted to the flow which is the, you know, the function that composes those three functions. The flow depends on those three functions, but each of the individual functions doesn't depend on each other. And that's, that's good, that's very nice. And the call stack is very flat. Uh, on the object-oriented way of doing things, though, as you can see, the call stack is, uh, is, is deep. And even worse, you have your object zero on this diagram, depending directly or indirectly on objects one, two and three. An object uh, one depends directly on or indirectly on objects two and three. An object uh, two depends on object three. So you have lots more dependence with the O approach than you do with the functional approach. Even if you make your hardest uh, efforts to minimize dependence between modules, you're still paying a price when you go object-oriented versus functional. Another nice thing about the functional uh, approach is that functional designs map very naturally to uh, our technical designs and, and our flows. And so uh, flow charts can be used as documentation for both the business logic and the, uh, to, to do the technical design uh, documentation in, in pictures, if you, will, if you will. The difference between the flow charts for the business functionality and the flow charts for the uh, technical flows is 
mostly one of uh, granularity. The business flow charts, they typically go all the way down to the level of specifying the internals of business functions. You know, that's what business analysts like to do. Uh, but the technical flow charts, they stop at the level of the function objects, so they're, they're more concise. But the beauty of this whole thing is that there's a very natural mapping from the business side to the technical side, and the, uh, the dialogue, the interaction with business analysts is much more productive, much more natural. So summing up, there are many advantages to using the function flow uh, pattern to structure the application. Most of those advantages stem stem directly from sticking to the functional paradigm from the top to the bottom. Uh, but some of the advantages on this uh, slide are more, as I said earlier, uh, specific to the way we pursued things and uh, have to do with the way we did uh, dependency injection, configuration, something that uh, my colleague Hilda will cover a little bit later. So, uh, back to Scala and the light band stack. Uh, obviously, th there was uh, a shock. It was pretty intimidating to the uninitiated having to deal with Scala, Play, and Akka. Um, the functional flow pattern was a key way of reducing that initial shock. Uh, by minimizing the complexity of the overall solution and the uh, individual modules. So even though they were being written in different language, people were not accustomed to, they were, you know, things that people could, could uh, come to grasp with. Uh, we considered uh, very carefully the use of Akka uh, as part of our main uh, development toolkit, but uh, we decided that uh, Akka actors would detract from the straightforward mapping from the business flows to the implementation, and uh, in terms of ease of development and testing. Um, so we do use ACA, but not uh, directly for uh, business logic. Uh, we, we achieved our goals of uh, reactiveness, non-blocking execution by using futures composition, and we followed the pattern that was uh, well proven by the example of Twitter. Um, we adhered to the functional paradigm, obviously, uh, but we were very pragmatic about it. Um, we stuck to the core principles of immutability and function composition and you know, leveraging uh, combinators on collections, uh, but we deliberately stayed away from the, the style of trying to code uh, Haskell and Scala and using Scala Z and CATS and libraries of that ilk. I mean, those are great libraries, but uh, not for the, the right choice for for our circumstances. Um, to uh, minimize the technology introduction risk, uh, we also uh, allowed uh, the base level functions to be coded in Java. So that, uh, you know, that was a way to uh, more easily use resources we already had, as well as to, uh, in the eyes of our sponsors, to make uh, it more palatable as a way for us to introduce Scala and, and functional programming and the functional paradigm, the light band stack, say, hey, you, you, you don't have to take it all 100%. We're, we're still doing some things in Java here. But at the end of the day, we did really most of, uh, of the important things, all of the structural stuff, all of the architecture was built in Scala. And even the, um, those uh, base core functional modules that we started writing in, in Java, developers, as they picked up Scala, they said, I don't want to code stuff in, in Java anymore. I want to code my business logic in Scala. So uh, it's been a very effective uh, process for us. Uh, an obvious uh, but important thing to have is a set of coding standards. So uh, we do. We have coding standards. Um, and also, another way to deal with the uh, learning curve is to avoid having to learn things. The fewer things you have to learn, the, the easier the learning curve. So uh, we use Play and Akka, but in the case of Play, we use Play uh, just to expose our RESTful services, our endpoints. Uh, the vast majority of our code has no direct dependence whatsoever on Play. It's just you know, things like some filters, our handling hook, and 
uh, some architecture uh, kind of wrappers that wrap our services and, and turn them into actions. Uh, so it's very easy for us to yank out play and replace it with something like uh, Akka HTTP with very, very minimal impact to our application. And the good news is that most of our developers didn't really have to deal with play directly. And likewise with uh, Akka, we use Akka for some important architecture features of our application, uh, but we did not use it for the day-to-day uh, -day core business logic development. So the vast majority of our developers didn't have to, uh, to learn Akka. Non-blocking code, big challenge, big, you know, very different way of thinking about things. Um, so many things are, are more challenging with non-blocking code than they are with uh, standard blocking code. So some languages like Go and Erlang provide really nice uh, out-of-the-box features to deal with uh, non-blocking execution. Uh, Scala has got some, some capabilities like uh, futures for comprehensions, we've got uh, Akka actors, but in reality, um, some of these other languages do make uh, development with a non-blocking architecture, a non-blocking execution model easier than, than Scala does. Um, nonetheless, on the JVM, there aren't really that many, many options, so uh, Scala is, is, is the best available at this, this point in time. Um, in terms of uh, testing, uh, unit testing, Scala test does provide some uh, good facilities to deal with uh, futures and other non-blocking execution concerns. And uh, also, Akka has its toolkits that, that uh, help in, in that area as well. Uh, one big you know, uh, issue everybody uh, deals with when writing non-blocking uh, code is uh, propagation of log contexts because you have a request that uh, is executed across multiple threads and so you want to be able to correlate uh, log uh, entries uh, which are generated from code executing different threads so um, having a way to propagate your uh, log context across the threads is very important so there are well-known techniques for doing that but it's something that that has to be done has to be set up doesn't happen, uh, doesn't happen if you don't uh, set it up correctly. Uh, more, uh, more challenging than uh, log context propagation is the issue of performance monitoring with non-blocking uh, execution on, on multiple threads. And uh, the tools that currently exist uh, for Scala, um, Futures, and Play, uh, well, basically there aren't any tools uh, out there that help with performance uh, monitoring for these technologies. There are some tools that help with performance monitoring for ACA, but uh, unfortunately they're not really useful with an architecture like ours. Uh, we have uh, talked with uh, Lightband. Uh, hopefully there will be some um, new capabilities forthcoming from Lightband to, um, to address this uh, issue in the not too uh, distant future. The, the tools that currently exist, like New Relic, are just completely useless uh, when it comes to, uh, to futures in play. Uh, so we've uh, been left with uh, the need to cobble together our own you know, patchwork of uh, some custom coding, use of Kmon, uh, a little bit of New Relic, a little bit of Splunk uh, to produce some performance statistics, but uh, we're, we're just not happy with the state of affairs in that area. So that concludes uh, my portion of the presentation. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Hilda, who will, who will carry on. So um, in addition to the function flow patterns uh, approaches that Paulo just described in the first portion of the architecture that sharing here, we also need a, a set of architectural uh, guidelines, patterns, uh, utilities and uh, help libraries to provide the common um, architectural capability to the application. So as listed here is uh, uh, some capability we built when we uh, building up our current application. And I'm going to walk you through 
several interesting patterns uh, and uh, frameworks we uh, built. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is actually an uh, architectural pattern in style framework. It's a, a type safe uh, dependency injection. So many of the Java enterprise developers uh, and, you know, were leveraging dependency injection in the past 10 years. It is quite important for enterprise uh, application development. So you can allow some parallel team to do the development and testing at the same time. And also, uh, when we're evaluating the framework currently available, uh, it's pretty complex, like Spring and Juice even come up with uh, play and the cake patterns. And uh, actually, when we're looking back, say, look, we have Scala. Uh, by using Scala, we do not actually need a, a sophisticated framework to do the um, dependency injection. So what we decided to do yeah, so was a, a simple, a clear discipline on how you're going to managing or organizing your dependency and then wire them during the boom module and uh, during the startup time. So wiring is actually pretty uh, simple. All you need to do is instantiate the function object and then inject them to the uh, Ob constructor of the object you already constructed. Uh, by doing that, it's uh, um, already fulfill our needs to have a dependency injection. But it is a, um, a simple uh, and a scalable way to provide us the capability to allow us to ap assemble the application and also in a type safe manner. So there is uh, a lot of wiring mistakes uh, which can be identified during the compilation time instead of the uh, execution time. So um, in conjunction with uh, the type safe dependency injection pattern, we also come up with something as the type safe configuration framework. Now, uh, we consider it's uh, highly desirable. The application code, it depends on the library that needs the configuration file. So our boom module, which we described prior to managing our dependency injection, also have a responsibility to read the configuration file. And then they injecting, um, they converting the configuration file to an object, which is injected into the application code. Um, so that way, oh, there's only one um, module, which is the boom module, have a direct access to the configuration file. And all the subsequent code that there has no direct access to configuration file, they have access to this type safe configuration context. Uh, this is a provider way to identify the configuration issues and the early time and also um, to keep everybody on the same page, what is a configuration variable you can use. Uh, another interesting architectural framework and capability we have been built here is the Five Forget framework. Now, this framework was allow us to easily turn down a REST endpoint to a Five Forget endpoint. What that means is a request to send it to the system will be received and the queued and, but, um, for process later, but the acknowledgement of the response will be immediately sent to the caller. To implement this capability, uh, we are choosing uh, ActiveMQ to provide us a durable transaction queue. And we're also using ACA and Actor to put in and uh, getting the message in the queue. Now, um, for us, the transaction, durable transaction queue is very important because once we acknowledge we receive the uh, request, we have to honor it. So in this approach, we're just using trans GMS transaction. There's no XA transaction as needed. Now, in terms of uh, find forget process, it actually is uh, being uh, done by three ways and uh, three stages. And you can see from the numbering perspective. Uh, the first is a request was received, 
and the QDIT and acknowledgement was sent. So we send a unique token and back to the caller, which the caller will be used to fetch the result later. The second phase of the execution is the message was retrieved from the queue and a function flow will be executed. And we put the execution result into our distributed cache and, and, um, in the right corner. And the third stage of uh, the execution is to pull the, um, the client will call use the token to proceed from the st uh, step number one and pull the result back. So um, to implement uh, this five forget framework, uh, there's a two different approaches we've been using. Uh, the first approach, and we're using a separate execution context for the queue provider and the queue consumer. And the, the queue provider was uh, executed as a feature, and then a uh, pull of the ACA actor is to implement the consumer. And this, another approach we're taking is um, to have an uh, actor to managing first in, first out internal command for queue and DQ the request. And then the queue, in queue and the DQ uh, command was executed in the separate execution context, which also can be combined. Now, on top of this, we create uh, another um, interesting one for the sync over async. So sync over async is just a mode of execution. So uh, where the client will get the best of the best word. So what happened is uh, when the request was put uh, on received, it will put it into the queue for async uh, process. And if within the given time, uh, the response was received and we will uh, send back the client with the response. Now, if uh, we did not receive the response, and then we will send the client with a token, so the token, uh, client can use the same token, fetching the results in the later stage. And the implementation to achieve for sync over async was quite simple, which will create an intermediate client in between the ultimate client and the Fire Forget framework will fulfill the needs. So, while we're talking about function flow um, approaches, we're talking about all the you know, plumbing, the shared components, the uh, architectural components. So let's talk about uh, how we structure software. All these pieces we need to put together. So in here, all the modules in our um, software applications, including functions and uh, other program artifacts, including configuration files, has a specific role. So we enforce the separate of the concerns across different module types, which we call a stereotype. So this diagram is uh, illustrating a module stereotype for a REST services uh, provider. And uh, you will see uh, different types of the artifacts, and they have different stereotypes. And then there's relationships between the stereotypes. So there's a lot of uh, disciplines to put in here who can, what type of uh, um, components can communicate to each other, what kind of uh, components cannot talk to each other. So um, give us a structure and a, a very well-defined structure to producing an understandable code for our development team and also for the troubleshooting in the uh, later stage. So me, I'm often like easily can find what type of class I'm looking for according to this diagram and according to um, the corresponding um, the structure um, we have. So by all talking about the good part of it, and I think uh, uh, the most challenging uh, for us uh, is uh, um, to assemble a good team. To assemble a good team, which is uh, have be to deliver, to able to deliver a Scala and a Liban stack, it's probably the biggest challenge to the enterprise IT. But this one can be also successfully taken out. So I'd like to share some of our experience in here. So. 
first of all, you know, we need to define uh, architectural structure. We need to have uh, architectural disciplines, um, which we discussed all the things in the prior uh, presentation. But with all the architectural helping, but that's not enough, what do we really need um, to have a good team to deliver it? In composing of the team, it is essential to have a lead software architect who has seasoned in the JEE enterprise architecture, uh, enterprise application delivery, as well as uh, uh, in-depth experience and the knowledge about a function programming and a Scala. Now, it is pretty hard to find the people with the both combination of the both skills. Um, we actually don't have a good advice um, to offer here because it takes time to obtain the skills and you need to have a luck to have one. We are very lucky to have a Palo on the project which be able to provide this levels of the direction. Now, to our opinion, without that critical role, you probably can still um, give a shot, but you know, the, enable, the successful of the project probably will be low, and also will be a bumpy load uh, ahead of you. In terms of the team, um, we emphasize that we want to start with a small team, um, and they will be very selective. So the criteria when we're using for select build the initial seed of the team is we want to look for somebody who um, has very desire to learn new technology, but at the same time, and also uh, has experience to deliver um, enterprise uh, software application. In terms of the Scala, you know, we like to have some people with ex some level of exposure with the Scala, but if the developer does not know Scala at all, uh, at least the developer has to indicate, uh, have a clear indication they are able to learn the language in, uh, quickly. And uh, so some of the experience we have is if a developer has power experience with non-blocking programming in a different language like JavaScript, um, that's a good indicator uh, these people will pick up uh, the concept quite uh, quickly. So the development team will need to be um, creative, need to be quick learning, but that's not enough. The team has to follow the direction is given by the lead architect. And also the team has to follow the uh, guidelines and the coding standards provided to the project team. On the other hand, the lead architect also need um, to be able to experience and feel comfortable to provide the direction to the application development team. But at the same time, the lead architect needs to be open mind for innovations and uh, continuous improvement uh, based on the feedback provided by the, uh, by the team members. So um, the lead architect and team really need to work together. Uh, in terms of the SMEs, we've been um, incorporating several Scala SMEs in our project, but it's very, very difficult to be able to um, find a, a SME will fulfill our needs. Um, so in our case, we actually almost have a zero out of three in this area. So um, now let's talk about, so, so we have the team, so next thing is how you're going to train this team. So what we recommended here is uh, uh, we recommend a one week Scala training. Um, and we also like to have the lead architect to be part of the uh, faculty in the training class. Uh, it is very important to, to customize the training material based on your project needs. So for our project, we are talking about Scala foundations. Uh, we're talking about uh, collection futures, full comprehensions, immutables, and a function programming basics. Um, on top of that, after your basic uh, training, 
where the team is being trained by function um, design and uh, core architectural concepts uh, to, for the architecture we're going to be used for the project. Now, as time progressing, um, we can actually uh, instructing team, some of my team right now is taking uh, Coursera's class for uh, function principle in Scala and uh, function programming uh, design in Scala classes. Now, by all this, the key to start building up your team is a small team. So we highly recommend that you have a small team and start slowly to create your application code to make sure your application code follows your architectural designs, follows your coding standards. Have a large team to take off parallel at the same time, it's just not going to be helpful. And uh, also, we need to be able to refactoring. We need to be able to, you know, change the code, to follow the architecture, create a reference application architecture, truly demonstrating to application team how they should follow to proceed the remaining of the coding for the application. Now, one thing we found that it is uh, quite interesting is uh, uh, a good way to um, teaching Java developer and so also to ease the fear of a language is to use Scala as a testing tool to testing for the Java code. Uh, in our case, we're using Scala test and uh, we're using Gatling as a two Scala-based testing tool. Um, the team has really liked to it and uh, addict to it and uh, afterwards. So therefore, um, this is a conclude our presentation for sharing our experience for adapting function programming paradigm. And uh, we're now open for questions. Yes. Did you, uh, I, I'm going to assume for your team, so you, you're, you're following some basic agile development practices. Correct. Did, did you find any practices or modification uh, to that, the, the, the standard methodology that you use under, under your traditional Java models? Did you find any modifications to that helped in terms of growing a small team with a new level of expertise, perhaps in paired programming, you know, other sorts of things? or? Are you still kind of following the same agile models with your Scala team as with your broader team? So um, I think one thing we did in the beginning is that we allocate a big chunk of the time before the spring starts and uh, did the, the uh, architectural conceptual design and architectural blueprint and uh, define the software architectural paradigm and uh, uh, define all the frameworks. So that's the first thing. The second thing we do is uh, we have a spring zero what a Spring Zero really it is, is actually we um, allocate about um, a good chunk of time to um, do a reference app and also take a team go through the developing process and from how we're going to transit from functional design to technical design and also we um, create the inventory based on the module stereotype and what that means to the application developers. So that we build up a learning curve into the uh, Spring Zero. But after that, it's pretty much the same uh, methodology, regardless of your Java or Scala. But in, because of the Scala and because of the DevOps associated with it, make the agile more present. Paolo, you have any addition for this? No, that's good. Questions? Okay, so is my mic working? Yeah. Question was about, uh, I mentioned languages that uh, deal with the nastiness of non-blocking execution uh, in, in a easier way than 
uh, Scala does. So, yeah, I mean, um, you're talking about, uh, you're asking about the uh, patterns that we used? Oh, sure, other languages, yeah, sure. I mean, other languages, I, I mentioned a couple of them. Uh, you know, Go is one that's very popular. Uh, Erlang is very nice. Uh, you know, actors in Erlang are actually a lot easier to code with than actors in, in uh, Scala. They're both actors, but their the execution model is actually uh, different, and it's much more natural. Uh, basically, in, in Erlang, you code, you code as if your code is blocking, but the Erlang virtual machine behind the scenes makes everything non-blocking for you. But uh, with uh, Akka actors, you have to worry about these things yourself. If you write blocking code with an Akka actor, you, you, uh, you uh, freeze a uh, thread in the JVM. So very different model. Um, what else? I mean, there's Elixir, which is a new, more uh, user, uh, developer-friendly uh, interface to the Erlang uh, virtual machine. Um, I don't know about Haskell, I don't know anything about the Haskell parallel programming, but I'm sure the Haskell people love it and it's considered to be better than anything else. But <laughs> like everything else in the Haskell world, of course. Yes? So I have a question about you know, kind of bringing Java developers into the functional style. Like I've mm -hmm. tried to get traction within Java houses for Scala and what you end up seeing a lot of is people writing Scala in a very imperative way yes. because mm -hmm. it, it supports an object functional style. So uh, how do you kind of enforce people to embrace the functional nature of Scala and not writing Java code in Scala? Good question. How do you enforce the functional nature uh, and uh, avoid people writing Java in Scala? Uh, that, I think, has a lot to do with the uh, doing code reviews, doing design reviews, uh, coaching. Um, and having a small team is really important so you can set those patterns and then, you know, people get accustomed to those patterns of doing things. It becomes natural to them. So that's what uh, worked for us. But, you know, if you, have a, if you want to do it like in mass production with, uh, with very large teams, which we often uh, see uh, in uh, our company, it, it just doesn't work very well because people will fall back on, on what they're accustomed to. And without coaching and mentoring and reviews, uh, it's just kind of inevi in inevitable that they'll devolve to the imperative way of doing things. Yeah, I think in our case, uh, we built uh, the first team. It's about you know six developers. Yeah. And that Spring, and Spring Zero yeah, was very Spring important. Yeah, Spring Zero right? was really do is yeah. an architectural team and with like a couple of app dev people. And then we now we have 12 people. We have three Spring goes on. They separate into three different Springs. Yes. Okay, sure. Um, we, I mean, there's the uh, WS framework in uh, Play that is, um, it, it's based on uh, the NIM framework. And now I think it, Lightband took, took over responsibility for maintaining it. But it's a non-blocking HTTP request framework. So it's very easy to just make, make a call using the WS framework. It returns the future. And then that future is just composed with other futures in your uh, for comprehension in the flow. Yeah, very so people have to very uh, straightforward. Uh, yeah. return future, don't return the object. Yeah. Because when the yeah. normal Java developer is thinking, oh, I need to return some domain object back mm -hmm. to the caller, and that you're going to break your non blocking. Question? Yes. Uh, talk about your decisions between Scala and Java 8, or maybe Java Stream API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we did consider after the fact. Uh, we uh, have, in fact, used Java 8. Uh, some of the developers who wrote some biz business logic modules in Java, they created those functions using Java 8, and they are incorporated into our flows, just like the Scala modules are. But, uh, you know, Scala is, is more concise. So at the end of the day, even though Java 8 does uh, move, it inches towards the functional paradigm, but Scala is much easier to, to do the functional programming than Java 8. So uh, back to your question with OBS and futures, uh, what happens in our case, one of the biggest uh, shocks that people have in our code base is that all of our functions are of future of a trial or something. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the question was about the future of a try. Uh, well, we don't have futures of tries, we have futures. There's no need to do future of a try because the future already encapsulates a try, right? The, the, the future is completed by a try, so doing a future of a try is kind of, you know, putting a try around a try. It, so it's not a good idea. Just do plain futures and, you know, within, within a, a function that's executing within a future, if you throw an exception, that exception becomes a try in the completion of the future. Yeah, so Paulo, we need to close out the oh, for need, the next one. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Paulo and I will be around uh, yeah, uh, in the we'll conference. Happy to and we're happy to answer additional anybody. questions. But yeah. thanks for coming to our presentation. Thank you.